irreversible absorption. And yesterday, I kind of got uh, close to the end of car parking, and then I was rushing and got myself a little balled up. So let me just recapitulate what we learned about car parking. So uh, what we have in mind here is we have cars of length one. that um, permanently park in any spot of length x greater than 1. And again, uh, in the same spirit as what we did for dimer and kamer parking, the basic degree of freedom is the empty interval probability, namely the probability that we have an empty interval of size x, but we don't pay attention to what happens outside of x. And by using that degree of freedom, uh, it turns out that we can write local equations for the evolution of these empty interval probabilities. So in the case of car parking, uh, so let me call EXT the probability of an empty interval of length, length x. And then um, we were able to write down a, a, a rate equation for this empty interval probability. So it's dE of xt dt. So there's minus x minus 1 ext. So the, that's one term in the equation. And so this corresponds to filling a parking spot whose length x is bigger than 1. And so the number of ways or the number of places you can put a car of length 1 in a spot of length x is x minus 1 places. And then there is the effect of uh, parking in a larger parking spot that impinges on, a, 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 on the interval of length x. So there's a minus 2 because I can park at either end of this interval. The integral from x to x plus 1, e, y, t, dy. Again, let me try and write this more neatly. So this corresponds to filling the interior of inter interval. Here is where I have a larger parking spot, but I, part of the car impinges on the uh, in empty interval of size x. And so this is the loss term. And this corresponds to the situation where the parking spot is larger than 1. And then there's a similar set of equations uh, for the case where the parking spot is smaller than 1. In that case, all you have to do to write down the equations is just invert the, or reverse the roles of x and 1. And so you're trying to park uh, not a car in a parking spot, you're, but you're trying to put a parking spot over a car. And so all you have to do is just reverse the order of x and 1. And so you just have this. And all I did here was just wherever I saw an x and a 1, I just in, uh, reversed uh, their roles. And so what we did then is we did the same kind of trick of trying to solve these equations. We first focused on the, on the top equation, and we in introduced this quantity um, uh, ext is equal to phi e to the minus x minus 1 t. Uh, whoops. Other way around. No minus sign. And um, if we plug this onsatz into this equation, then we end up with just a simple equation for phi. And uh, we can solve that equation. And so what we found last time was phi as a function of t was equal to the following thing. It was equal to exp minus 2, the integral from 0 to t, um, 1 minus e to the minus t prime over t prime dt prime. Okay, and now, um, <clears throat> now that we have this, in some sense we have the solution, but what we want to extract from this is the coverage of the system. And so um, the coverage, uh, we can determine the following way. So the coverage, rho of t, so that's 
nothing more than one minus, so that's like, if I look at a little infinitesimal region of space, is there a car there? That's one minus the probability that that infinitesimal region of space is empty. So that's one minus E of zero T. So uh, it turns out though that to find E of zero T, we can go back to our original equations and see that uh, if I look at um, uh, here, if I look at X equals zero, from, you know, since this is true for any x less than 1, let's look at x equals 0. So at x equals 0, we have dE0 t by dt. So we just have minus E1t, and then there's, there's no contribution from this because this integral goes over 0 range. So this is equal to minus E1t. So uh, from this, we can now integrate this and get... Um, E zero t, so we'll have E zero t minus E at of zero at t equals zero. But the probability that an empty an interval is empty at t equals zero, it's all one. So that's just minus one, and so that's equal to minus the integral of E one of t dt from zero up to t. But if we go back to here, we see that from this equation, E one t is the same as phi. So finally, our coverage, which is 1 minus E0, is just, um, whoops, yeah, so this is minus sign. So 1 minus E0 is just the plus of this guy, which is plus the integral of phi dt. So finally, we have our result that rho of t is equal to the integral from 0 to t of phi of t dt. And so let me just write this out now. So this is the integral from 0 to t dt, uh, dt, I'm sorry, 5t prime dt prime. So it's dt prime, 5t prime, and so that's exp of uh, minus 2, the integral from 0 now to t double uh, t prime, uh, 1 minus e to the minus t double prime, t double prime, dt double prime. So that is sort of a recapitulation of what I did at the end of yesterday's lecture. Now, there's one interesting feature, very interesting feature of this result, which is we can ask, um, how quickly is the final coverage approached? We saw in the case of Dimer and Kamer uh, deposition that the final state was approached uh, exponentially quickly in time. Let's ask, what is the behavior of the approach to the final state? So let's look at rho of infinity minus rho of t. So rho of infinity will just be the integral of this guy to infinity. So when I take rho infinity minus rho of t, that's just going to be the integral from t to infinity of this, of this expression. So this thing is integral t to infinity dt prime exp minus 2, 0 to t prime, 1 minus e to the minus t double prime, t double prime, dt double prime. And now if we're interested in the asymptotic approach, well, uh, let's, so let's have t large, so that means that t is large here, which means that when I'm doing um, the integral dt prime, I'm starting from a large value of t, t, I'm sorry, large value of t prime. So that means that inside of this integral, t prime is large. And if you now stare at this integrand for large t, or large t double prime, this exponential can be ignored with respect to the one. So if we just were to ignore this, then you would have e to the minus two over t double prime integral. When I integrate this guy, I would get minus, so it's asymptotically minus two log t prime because I just ignore this guy. And so I integrate uh, one over t double prime, that's log t, that's gonna be just log of t prime. So I have minus two log t prime. But then I'm exponentiating it. So when I exponentiate it, this is nothing more than t prime to the minus 2 power. And then I'm integrating it from t to infinity. And so the whole thing is 1 over t. So in this case, the approach to the final state is much slower. And it's power law rather than exponential. And so you know, this is what we've all encountered if you're trying to park your car in downtown Rome or downtown New York. 
There's very few parking spots and it takes a long time before it fills up, fills up. Um, another interesting aspect of this, which I'm not going to discuss, but it's, it's fun to think about, which is like, suppose you're talking about parking in a real city with no well-defined parking spaces like Rome. Um, Trieste. Or Trieste, okay. Cars leave, so there's also desorption of cars. And one can ask, what is the final state of, the, uh, of this absorption, desorption process? So there will be like some final steady state density. And it turns out that there is a nice analogy between this reversible car parking problem and granular compaction. There are these very beautiful experiments that were done a long time ago of just taking sand and just tapping, 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 and looking how the density would increase as a function of time. And it turns out that uh, the density has an inverse logarithmic relaxation to the final jamming density. So if you imagine doing car parking with a very um, high rate of cars trying to park and a very small rate of cars trying to leave the system, this, pro this process also compacts and it has the same features as a logarithmic, inverse logarithmic compaction of granular sand. Um, and so it's, it's a fun problem to think about. Okay, so um, that sort of concludes everything I have to say about uh, irreversible absorption in one dimension. And what I want to now do is to turn to absorption in higher dimensions. And it turns out that in higher dimensions, there's only one thing known. And as you're going to see, it's partly because now the geometry of the problem becomes pro you know, complicated. And because of that, that, one can do only looking at the asymptotic approach to the final state. So let's look at adsorption in d greater than 1. And let's talk about the absolute simplest thing we can think of, which would be adsorption of spheres in a continuum d-dimensional space. Uh, and so let me just do two dimensions, because at least I can draw it on the blackboard. So we adsorb you know, circles on this plane here, and whenever there's an open spot that can fit a, a coin, we put another coin. We keep doing this ad infinitum until, there's, until those remaining spots are at a point where there's, it's not big enough to fit a coin, and so we reach jamming. And the question we might want to ask is, how quickly do we reach jamming? The actual jamming density is, is a hard problem that we don't, uh, you, know, you know, there's no uh, full solution of, but at least we can determine how quickly jamming is approached and understand something about the dynamics of the process altogether. So let's look asymptotically in a large time limit when um, you know, the system is close to jamming and so you have to search for a while before you find a spot where you can put down another coin. And so you know, here is say um, one coin, uh, here is another coin, and let me try and arrange this right. So here is a third coin. And so, you know, when you put down their coins, the, the thing is that the next coin, like you can't put a coin here because it's going to overlap with this guy. So if this is of radius r, there's a region of radius 2r, which might be called the exclusion zone, where I cannot put a coin inside of here. So similarly, there's another exclusion zone here. You can't put anybody here. There's another exclusion zone here where you can't put anybody. But there's a tiny little region here where if I put a coin here, it's just barely going to fit inside of the remaining spot. So in the long time limit, what determines the um, dynamics of the process is these tiny little um, exclusion zones where I can put like another particle. And so the dynamics is basically determined by the density of these sort of allowed zones. So um, let me call CLT the density of allowed zones And the index L here is to indicate that these allowed zones, well, first of all, they're geometrically complicated. They're typically like these sort of triangular, con concave triangular regions. But they have a characteristic size scale, L. 
you know, like maybe it's not equilateral, but you know, there'll be a characteristic a length scale associated with this. So density of allowed zones of scale L. And how do these uh, zones disappear? Well, if I put a coin here, then that zone has disappeared. So I can write down a rate equation for how the density of these exclusion zones changes with time. And since they're decreasing, uh, well, okay, I'll put it on over here, minus sign, they're decreasing. And how do they decrease? Well, it's proportional to the density of exclusion zones of size L to begin with. So this is C, this is C of LT is equal to minus this. But the probability that you put down a coin is proportional to the number of zones times the area of the zone because that's, you know, there's, that's how many ways you can fit a coin inside of the zone. So it's proportional to the area of the zone, which scales like L squared. So I'm going to put here squiggle to note that this is kind of an approximate identity. And then I have to just sum up over all exclusion zones of any size. I'm sorry, I don't sum up. This, this, is just, this is just the, yeah, this is all there is to it. So for a, for a fixed size, all right, I already broke my first piece of chalk. Um, for a fixed size, uh, this, is, um, this is how the density of these allowed zones disappears. And so this equation is easy to solve because it's just exponential. And so I'm going to get from this C of LT scales this E to the minus L squared T. So that's how these exclusion zones disappear. Second point is now we kind of ask, well, how does the coverage change? So how does d rho by dt, how does that change? Well, the coverage is only going up, and it goes up every time a coin can land in an allowed exclusion zone. And so how, do, how can I put a coin in an allowed exclusion zone? Well, um, so first of all, I have to have an exclusion zone of size L. And um, I want to integrate over all sizes of exclusion zones. And so this is going to be integral e to the minus L squared T um, dL. Uh, let me just check one thing. Oh, yeah, so sorry, once again, I mean, uh, if I want to increase the density, it's proportional to the exclusion zone, again, times the size of the exclusion zone so that the, part, that the coin can actually land inside. So there's going to be an L squared dL. Okay, so how do we do this integral? And here, once again, um, scaling is the e easiest way to estimate this integral because here we see the combination of variables L squared T. So what I can do here is I can multiply by root t for this guy. I can multiply by t over here, divide by 1 over t to the 3 halves. And so this now becomes an integral of, say, e to the minus z, z, uh, z, I'm sorry, e to the minus, let's call it z squared, z squared dz, times 1 over t to the 3 halves. So I don't care about this integral because it's some number of order one, but all the time dependence is contained here. So this is telling me how rho is increasing as a function of time. And finally, rho infinity minus rho of t, which would be the integral of this quantity, it scales as 1 over t to the 1 half. So that is the main result, and in fact the only result that's known about irreversible absorption in higher dimensions, which is that the approach to the final state is power law in time, and power law because, again, there is this continuum of possible shapes that can accommodate uh, additional uh, coins. And uh, this result is true for two spatial dimensions. And you can kind of see almost immediately that if you were to do the same calculation in higher dimensions, so the only difference is that you would have here not um, L to the 2, but L to the power D. There would be just Ds floating around everywhere. And so in, um, 
in general dimension, this is t to the minus d over 2. And so uh, this is the main uh, result for irreversible absorption of isotropic objects in higher dimensions. And, um, you know, people have played lots of additional games of this, uh, you know, anisotropic objects, you know, objects can move, objects with different shapes, but this is the main result. Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. What am I, what am I doing here? Wait, wait a second. What am I doing? Just bear with me a second. T to the 1 over D. Sorry. Yeah, that's stupid. Okay. All right. So, you know, once again, I'm kind of at the end of a particular topic. So if there's any questions from whatever audience is still left, I mean, you know, fire away and before I go on to something else. Okay. So now I come to uh, a topic of the dynamics of non-equilibrium spin systems. This uh, is a major part of this course because spin systems play a huge role in, in our understanding of many body systems and statistical mechanics in general. And uh, understanding the dynamics of a non-equilibrium spin system has been a very rich problem uh, for which uh, there's still many interesting open questions left. So I'm going to talk about the dynamics of the Ising model. So the Ising model is a very simple idealized model for ferromagnetism where you imagine that you have a lattice, and each side of the lattice is a two-state spin that can either point up or down, and there is an interaction energy uh, that favors ferromagnetic order, and this is embodied by taking the Hamiltonian minus J summation, uh, let me call this sigma I, sigma J, where the sum is over nearest neighbors, I and J are nearest neighbors to each other, and here sigma I is equal to plus or minus one. And so if sigma i equals sigma j, then it contributes minus j to the energy. If they're misaligned, it contributes plus j. So the interaction energy itself um, favors uh, ordering of the spins. And what um, competes with that is thermal agitation. And so there's this competition between thermal agitation and ferromagnetic order that gives rise to a phase transition. Now, the Ising model has played a paradigmatic role in our development of statistical mechanics, and so maybe it's worthwhile to just spend five minutes giving a little bit of history to this, because I, you know, will the students know, like, history of the Ising model? No? Maybe? Maybe not. Okay. So let me give a little, a little bit of history, because it's very colorful and very interesting. So in 1920, Wilhelm Lenz, who was a very respected, you know, hair doctor professor in Germany, proposed to his PhD student, Ernst Ising, and even though we pronounce it the Ising model, if you're speaking German, you say Ising. So he pr uh, pr uh, proposed to his graduate student, Ernst Ising, you know, we really have to have a, a spin model for, uh, I'm paraphrasing, a spin model for phase transition. Um, the most successful model for a phase transition was the Van der Waals theory, which turns out got Van der Waals a Nobel Prize. But it was a mean field, a description of a phase transition. It was not microscopic in character. It was just purely phenomenological. But it des described phase transition between a fluid phase and a gas phase. Please, sir. Yeah. Please, sir. I would like to know what is the meaning of minus in front of the Isimodent, the meaning of minus. So I say that again. Why is there what? Why is there a minus? Why is the meaning of minus in front of the rising model? Yeah, so the minus is yes, sir. For fer that's for ferromagnetic interaction. So notice that if sigma i equals sigma j, the product is 1, and it contributes minus. And negative energy is low energy, which means that it favors it at, at low temperature. Does, does that answer your question? Uh, does it? Uh, I hope so. 
Anyways, um, yeah, so if it was a plus sign, that would favor spins to be misaligned, and that would correspond to the antiferromagnetic uh, Ising model. Anyway, so, you know, Lenz told Ising, solve the Ising model, and so he developed, a, you know, he used a transfer matrix approach to solve the Ising model in one dimension and found no phase transition. So it was a flop. And in fact, uh, Ising, after this, uh, taught high school in Germany. He had actually suffered a lot during... Um, World War II, but then he came to the United States and he taught like at junior colleges and high schools in the United States. So he was basically out of physics altogether and discovered only very late in his life that he was actually very famous. It's kind of a funny story. But anyways, so uh, because there was no phase transition in one dimension, you know, then people said, well, there's no phase transition in one dimension, there's no fa phase transition in any dimensions, the model's not interesting. But then uh, in the 30s, people like Pyros looked at the model again and was convinced that there was a phase transition in two dimensions and higher. And then I think it was in 1937, it was Cromer's Vanier uh, developed this uh, duality relationship that showed that there had to be a phase transition. And then in 1944, Lars Onsager actually solved the two dimensional Ising model exactly. And it's a tour de force of mathematical physics. If you want to be either inspired or depressed, depending on your perspective, you look at this paper and you say, holy smokes, this is amazing. And in 1952, uh, I guess it was T.D. Lee, then found the magnetization of the two-dimensional Ising model. And apparently, there was a story that somewhere around 1950, e, um, Onsager had solved for the magnetization and never published it, but he wrote somewhere in some uh, conference proceedings, not a conference proceedings, but just at a conference, he wrote on the blackboard, I found the magnetization of the two-dimensional Ising model and wrote on the blackboard and never published it. But then uh, T.D. Lee solved it and, and wrote a paper on it. And again, if you want to be inspired or impressed or, or depressed, uh, you can read this paper. And the thing that I find the most amazing is, first of all, the mathematics is just amazing. But then he writes at the very end, I'd like to thank Bell Labs for giving me a summer research internship to do this project over the summer. So, you know, he did this project over the summer. Or I forget if it was Bell Labs he thanked or whatever it was. But, you know, he, he, did, he went for a summer project and solved the, the two-dimensional Ising model. Anyways, um, so after that, uh, you know, people then have spent a lot of effort trying to solve the Ising model in higher dimensions, and it seems like this is uh, never going to happen. So if you really want to be super-duper famous, solve the Ising model in three dimensions, see where you get. Okay, but anyways, um, so the thing is that the equilibrium properties of the Ising model are fairly well understood. And roughly speaking, the spatial dimension plays an important role um, in that uh, in one dimension there's no phase transition, in two and three dimensions there's a non-mean field phase transition with non-trivial critical point exponents. In four dimensions and above, mean field, mean field theory turns out to be asymptotically correct, and then we can s understand the properties of the Ising model just by uh, solving the mean field limit, which is certainly much simpler. So that is the equilibrium properties of the Ising model. And one could fill up an entire course of discussing how to solve it in one, in one dimension, two dimensions, uh, scaling approaches, renormalization group, and all of that. But I'm not talking anything about equilibrium properties. I'm looking at non-equilibrium properties, the dynamics of the Ising model. And it turns out that the basic problem statement is the following. Uh, or the in most interesting case is the following, which is that when you say you're looking at non-equilibrium properties, you're imagining that you start with a system at one temperature and you change the temperature and you ask how the system responds. And so if you start at low temperature, you're starting with ferromagnetic order and you raise the temperature, you'll just go to a disordered state. That turns out not to be terribly interesting. The more interesting situation is starting at a high temperature where the magnetization is zero and cooling it to where the magnetization is non-zero, below the phase transition temperature, and asking, how does magnetic order emerge from the lack of order? And there's, there's three different types of situations one can consider. One can start at high temperature and cool to the critical temperature. One can start at high temperature and cool to below the critical temperature. Or one starts at high temperature and cools to zero temperature. And it turns out that if one's looking at the relaxation properties, it doesn't matter whether you uh, cool to below the critical temperature or zero temperature, it's all the same dynamics. So to make life simple, let's just go from cooling from where we started at high temperature and cool to zero temperature. 
and let's do it infinites infinitely quick. So we'll do it in, you know, instantaneous what's called a quench from infinite temperature to zero temperature. Another aspect of this is our, our initial state can be anything above the critical temperature where the um, magnetization is equal to zero. And again, it's simplest to start at infinite temperature, so there's absolutely no, mag no ordering between the spins and suddenly quench to zero temperature. So that is the basic uh, phenomenon that we want to understand. So the basic goal is understand what happens in an instantaneous, instantaneous quench to t equals zero. Quench from, say, from t equals infinity to t equals zero. So at this stage, it's worth showing the movie now. So I have a very brief movie, just takes 10 seconds to show, that shows a typical relaxation uh, situation. We can play it a few times so you, so you really see it. So the, this is some, so the blue and red, are, I mean the blue and yellow are, are two different phases of the Ising model and we, we set the system going and by the way, can everybody see this who's out, out there in the virtual world? Can someone yes. tell us? Can someone chime in? Do you see it? Yes, yes. Okay, very good. So again, the blue and the yellow are meant to represent the two different phases, spin up and spin down. And we start with our initial state with a random distribution, and then we uh, set the system going. And so what you see is that there's a very complex, you know, coarsening process going on. The point here is that if we're going, if we're quenching to zero temperature, the spins like to be aligned. And because they like to be aligned, that means that an interface where two, you know, where a boundary between uh, misaligned spins, it, the system doesn't like it. So it's trying to minimize the length of the interface. So the dynamics is basically minimizing the length of the interface as the system evolves. And so as it evolves here, the interface, which is very ramified at the beginning, gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And eventually you get to the point that you reach the ground state. So that is the type of phenomenology that we'd like to try and understand. So uh, it turns out that even in two dimensions, uh, there's many unusual uh, anomalies associated with the dynamics. That's fine. Thank you very much. Um, and so first of all, before we understand what happens in two dimensions, which uh, actually is very difficult, I'd like to look at simpler cases, which will be uh, the mean field limit and the one-dimensional case. And we'll see that in the mean field limit and the one-dimensional case, already here there's a lot of interesting mathematics to understand, a lot of interesting phenomenology to understand as well. Okay, so the basic thing is that we've got to then start by writing down um, the master equation for the probability distribution of a given configuration of spins. So our basic variable is the probability of a configuration of spins. So, um, actually, um, sigma. So this is, this is the probability of a spin configuration collectively uh, called si sigma at time t. So uh, as I move along here, I'm going to start getting a bit sloppy with notation because it's always hard to write these curly brackets. But, you know, for the first time, I'm just being pedantic. So this is meant to represent a state. If I have n spins in the system, I have two to the n possible spin states. And so this is the probability of being in a particular one of those two to the n possible spin states. And what we want to compute, if we, if we could really do everything, we want to compute this full probability distribution. But what we're going to content ourselves with is understanding just the evolution of this probability distribution in state space. So once again, um, you know, like I'm going to go back to the very first picture I think I drew on the very first day, which is saying that, you know, we can represent our state space as these two to the n points. And so here is a particular spin configuration, S. And... Um, I'm going to think about a very simple class of dynamics known as single spin flip dynamics, where if you're in a particular spin configuration, 
the way that you change is you pick a spin at random and you flip the spin and if you, you know, and depending, and we're going to see what are the rules in which the spin flip is actually allowed, but we're going to take a spin and so, uh, and we're going to flip one of them. So let me just draw two points in the state space so I don't clutter up this drawing. So here's another state where uh, I can think of it as spin prime. And so the prime here is meant to denote that uh, a, a spin at a given site has, has, has changed its state. And so there will be some rate, W, oh, and I, I keep changing from sigma to S, so this is sigma, sigma. So there will be some hopping rate, sigma to sigma prime, that I pick, a, the I, say, the i spin. So, you know, maybe I should even put an index here which I'm not going to do throughout the rest of this lecture because it's too gloppy a notation. But I pick one spin, the i spin, and uh, if I flip it, then I'll go to a new state, sigma prime, where the i spin has been flipped. And there'll be a transition rate, w sigma going to sigma prime. And similarly, there is a hopping rate, w sigma prime going to sigma. And so uh, in principle, you know, I have two to the n spins. I have, you know, lots of arrows everywhere here. but um, all I want to do is draw the, these first two arrows. Now, um, you know, the one thing about these hopping rates at the moment, we have no idea what they are, and the way that we try and determine what, the, what they are is by a, a condition known as the detailed balance condition. And um, this is kind of an ad hoc, uh, uh, you know, an ad hoc assumption, but it works really well, and it seems like that's the best we can do. And the idea here is the following, which is that I have my state space, and I know that in equilibrium, the probability, so P equilibrium, is proportional to E to the minus beta, um, the Hamiltonian. And if my Hamiltonian is this thing over here, then this is proportional to E to the, so now the minus becomes a plus, beta J summation SI SJ. And if I flip the spin, then I'll have e to the minus beta of the Hamiltonian, but if spin i is flipped, then here I'm going to get, you know, p equilibrium here is proportional to e to the minus beta the Hamiltonian, which is proportional to e to the now minus beta j um, summation s. Oh, and I, I keep using s. I mean to use sigma. Sigma i, sigma j, sigma i, Sigma j. So uh, now I can. So so these are the equilibrium probabilities. So in principle, if I want to uh, be in equilibrium, I want to ensure that these equilibrium probabilities exist. And uh, the way that one does that is, first of all, let me write down the master equation itself. So d dp by dt. So again, there's a gain term, and there's a loss term, and the gain term is because of hopping events where I go, I'm at some other site and I hop to this particular site. And so there's a summation. Uh, so there's a sigma W sigma prime, sigma prime, sigma P sigma prime T. Um, and now, again, I'm not going to write down all the indices because it becomes a bit too tedious. But what do I mean by this and a sum over sigma prime? So what I mean by sigma prime here, that means that I take my configuration sigma, I take one of the n spins in the system, flip it, that defines one of the states of sigma prime, and I'm doing a transition rate from a state where one spin out of the n is flipped, and I'm going to the state I care about, sigma, and so this is a sum over lots of different states where, the, you know, n different, n minus one other states where the one of the other n minus one spins is flipped, and so the rate of flip going from sigma prime to sigma times a probability. That's a total gain probability. And then there's a loss because I can do the same kind of thing, sigma prime, w, sigma. I, so I start at, at state sigma. I flip one of the spins with the rate sigma, uh, w, sigma, sigma prime, and I have the probability of being in state sigma. And again, you know, so I should have written here curly brackets with uh, an i here to denote that it's the i spin, and I should have summed over, you know, sigma prime i. I hope that's understood, so I don't have to write so much, uh, you know, gloppy, gloppy indices everywhere. Okay, so the thing is that in equilibrium, I mean, and this is all we know about the system, is that in equilibrium, 
P, dp by dt should be zero. And so that tells us that the left-hand side, I mean, the two terms here have to balance. So again, let's, let's look at what's, what are the meaning of these two terms here. So this is the total influx rate into site I from everywhere. And this is the total outflow rate from this site to everywhere in the system. And so what we need is for those two rates, they have to balance. However, this is a very non-local uh, condition, and it's not easy to deal with such a non-local condition. And so uh, the detailed balance condition is actually a much stronger condition and makes things much easier, which is that you say that, well, I want the sum of the input and output rates to be equal. The detailed balance condition uh, is that I say instead of the sum of the rates are equal, I say that every single rate across every single link uh, is equal. So it's a much stronger condition, but it also simplifies things. So the detailed balance condition is just W sigma, um, w sigma, sigma prime P sigma T is equal to W sigma, sigma prime, sigma prime sigma P sigma prime T. That's all. Um, so that means that this, the total flow this way equals the total flow that way, and this is true for every single link across a network. And so it's called the detail balance condition. It's sort of like stated as an article of faith, and I guess that's all it really is. And then, but once we have this, we can actually work with it and mathematize it and start understanding the dynamics of, of the Ising model under this detailed balance condition. Okay, so let's just go a little further with this. So that says that W sigma... sigma Excuse me. Yeah. Why do you say that the detailed balance is an act of faith? Because it seems to me that it's the only way in which you can have uh, a stationary solution with time reversibility. So. Well, no, I mean, it's an act of faith because the true condition is just that I want the sum of the rates into any node and is equal to the outflow rate. If I, have, if I could make a model where I could actually enforce that, that would also satisfy uh, the necessary equilibrium condition. So, uh, you know, detailed balance is much stronger because you're saying that the sum of the rates on every single bond is equal. Does, does that address what you're worried about? Yeah, more or less. It's okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, anyways, uh, so let's just... Uh, Look, so the point is that with the detailed balance condition, we can determine the ratio of the forward rate and the backward rate. So this is nothing more than um, uh, P sigma prime T, P sigma T. Um, but this is equal to, um, <coughs> so here we have P sigma prime, so that's going to be, um, P sigma prime, so this is P of, oh yeah, so here is P sigma, and here is P sigma prime, so this is E to the minus uh, beta J sigma I sigma J, and then I have E to the plus beta J summation sigma I sigma I sigma I sigma J. And so uh, this condition allows us to determine the ratio of the hopping rates. We don't determine the actual hopping rates themselves, we only determine the ratio, but that means that if I don't know the full rate, there's an overall time scale, which I can choose to be one or anything I want, but all that really matters though is the ratio of the rates, because that's gonna determine like which states are favored and which states are disfavored um, by the dynamics itself. Okay, so, um, that's formally what we can do with this, but now let's actually work out some details and write something down that we can actually work with and understand like what is the meaning of this because right now this looks like some formal mumbo jumbo and we don't know really what we're talking about until we can actually say like what is the probability that a given spin is gonna flip in a given situation. So here I'm gonna use a very um, handy dandy trick uh, that works when you have uh, these Ising variables that are plus or minus one. So um, where's my trick? Um, let me just, yeah. 
So I'm going to use the following trick. So I have, it's the following. If I have e to the a sigma, where sigma is equal to plus or minus 1, and in fact, sigma could be 0 as well, so it could work for even a three-state system. So this thing is equal to cosh a sigma plus cinch a sigma. So because the cosh is an even function, so cosh of sigma is equal to cosh of minus sigma. So that takes care of the plus or minus 1. And if it's 0, then cosh of 0 is, is, is um, oh, I guess let's just do 1. I want the, yeah, so let's just do plus or minus 1. So in that case here, you can rub out the sigma. And here, since cinch is an odd function, this is the same as cosh A plus sigma cinch A. And so this I can write as uh, cosh A 1 plus sigma tanch A. And so I'm going to use this trick to now simplify what we have over here. So uh, the ratio of the rates, W sigma going to sigma prime divided by W sigma prime going to sigma. So that's equal to, so it's cosh. So this A here is, um, so, you know, this is a sum over, you know, since I'm focusing on site I, this sum is over the neighbors of I. I hope you can see that. And this is the sum J of the neighbors of I. So uh, the thing which plays the role of A is beta J, the summation over all sites J of sigma J. So um, the point here is that vo there's going to be a cosh A in both numerator and denominator that cancels, and then I'm just going to have uh, what's left over. So I'm going to have 1 plus, and because of the, the numerators with the minus sign, so it's 1 minus sigma I tanch of A. And what A is, is going to be beta J summation over all neighbors J of sigma J. And similarly, I have 1 plus sigma I tanch of beta J summation sigma J. And now this object here, so it's telling us like the local environment of the system. So uh, you can think of this as like the local field experienced by uh, site I. So I'm going to define this thing to be little h sub i, the local field because of the, of the neighboring spins. So we can write this a little bit more simply as 1 minus sigma i hyperbolic tanch of beta h i. And then I have 1 plus sigma i hyperbolic tanch of beta h i. Now, we've now found the ratio of the transition rates, but we don't know the r rate itself. But now, just for convenience, I'm going to say, well, let me choose the amplitude in, such, in the following simple way. I'm going to define w sigma sigma prime is equal to 1 half 1 uh, minus sigma i hyperbolic tanch of beta h i. So I've, I've chosen my amplitude this way. So this is the basic quantity that I want to be dealing with. And let's get a feeling for what is actually contained in here. So again, this is the probability that site I, that's the spin at site i will flip. And uh, let's look at the limit where beta is going to in infinity, which corresponds to zero temperature. So when beta goes to infinity, the hyperbolic tanch is either going to be plus 1 or minus 1, depending on the sign of the local field. So if the spins in the neighborhood are aligned with you, then uh, you're going to get plus 1 for this quantity. You'll get 1 minus, uh, uh, you know, so if the spins are aligned, then uh, you're going to get the product of yourself with your, local, with your local neighborhood is 1, and so you get 1 minus 1 is 0. So you're going to get a flip rate of 0. On the other hand, if your local neighborhood is anti-aligned with you, then this product will be minus 1, and you get 1 minus minus 1, you'll get 1 plus 1 is 2, divided by 1 half, you'll get 1. And so the point is that this model corresponds to majority rule. So after all this algebra, we have a very simple 
way of describing the actual dynamics from the point of view of a simulation that if I'm in a local neighborhood in two dimensions and three of my neighbors are saying vote for Trump and one of my neighbors is saying no, vote for Bernie Sanders, I'm going to vote for Trump because that's the lo what the ma local majority is telling me to do. Um, so the only amb ambiguity here, which we'll discuss uh, momentarily, is what happens if two people are saying vote Trump and two people are saying vote Sanders. What I do in that case, well, we'll, we'll come to that momentarily. But anyway, so that is uh, the starting point for now beginning to understand uh, the dynamics of the um, Ising model. And so what I want to do uh, now is work out two specific examples. One is the mean field limit, which is you can solve for everything, and it's very pedagogical and useful. And then I want to turn to the case of one dimension, <coughs> which is really an unbelievably rich subject, even though we know everything there is to know <coughs> about the one-dimensionalizing model. OK. <coughs> so I guess I want to keep this for later. It's much better when these cloths are dry than when they're wet. So we have uh, W sigma sigma prime is equal to 1 half 1 minus sigma i tanch beta h i. <coughs> okay, so I want to solve uh, this case, first of all, in the case of the complete graph which is a, a very simple way of implementing the, the mean field limit. So let's look at the complete graph solution. So what is a complete graph? It's a, it's, it's a bunch of sites, n sites, in which everybody is connected to everybody else. So in the case of four sites, you have these connections as well as the diagonal in both directions. And so everybody is a neighbor of everybody else. That means there's very good mixing. Everybody knows what everybody else is thinking or doing. And so this is a realization of the mean field limit where you can replace like the individual spin by the average spin. And this is a simple microscopic way of achieving this. Now it turns out that for the Ising model on the complete graph, one should modify the Hamiltonian slightly. So let me write what the Hamiltonian is. This is going to be a summation minus well, I'm going to choose this sort of the, the J, the interaction strength. I'll choose to be, uh, you know, one. But in fact, one needs an additional factor of one over N. Summation I less than J, so you count each pair tw only once, sigma I, sigma J, and there's a minus sign out in front. And the one over N is necessary so that you get a extensive energy because there's roughly N squared pairs here. And so for a system of N spins, I think my microphone, oh, it's still working. So to ensure that um, the energy is extensive, we need to have a 1 over n normalization factor. Okay, and so what I want to do now is to solve for the um, uh, dynamics of the Ising model here. So um, here I'm going to refer to my notes for a second. So now I'm going to use W of i to denote the rate at which the i spin in the system is flipping. So again, I'm being a little bit elastic with my notation, but I hope by context it's clear what I'm talking about. So Wi is the rate at which the i spin flips. And so this is equal to 1 half, 1 minus sigma i, and then I have hyperbolic tanch of my local field, which is now, um, so there's beta over n uh, summation, j not equal to i of sigma j. So this is the analog of what we had over here. So now my local field is that everybody else in the system is yelling at me, and so I have to add up over all these other spins, and then the coupling strength was 1 over n. Okay. <coughs> um, and so approximately, this I can write in the following way, 1 minus sigma i, hyperbolic tanch, so if this sum went over all spins in the system, so the average, you know, so this divided by 1 over n is just the average spin value in the system, which is nothing more than the magnetization. So with the correction of order 1 over n, I can replace this summation by just the magnetization itself. So this is tanch beta m. 
So that's my uh, flip rate. And now the thing that we want to compute, you know, now we're at the stage where we're ready to do some computation, which is let's ask ourselves, what is the behavior of a given spin in the system? So uh, let's look at dynamics, I don't know, dynamics of spin i. So we, fo we focus our attention on a single spin in the system. We ask, well, how does it change? And so the point is that uh, sigma i, how does it change? Well, you know, again, the way that you should think about the dynamics being implemented here is we have these different rates of picking a, a spin and flipping it. So we pick a spin at random, and with this rate, we're going to flip it. So in order for sigma i to change, uh, and so if sigma i changes, what happens? It's, if it's spin up, it's going to change the spin down, or it's spin down, it changes the spin up. So the change in sigma is minus twice its initial value. If it's plus one, it goes to minus one, so its change is minus two. It was, if it was minus one, it goes to plus one, and its change is again minus its initial value times two. So it changes, uh, it changes by minus sigma i with rate w i dt. And it's equal to itself with a rate one minus w i dt. So we can say that delta sigma over delta time, so the change is minus two sigma i, and the time is uh, one over the rate. And so when I put time down here, so this is one over the rate, so this is one over w i, and so we're going to get minus two sigma i w i. So this I'm going to write here as sigma i dot. But what we really want is a time rate of change of like something that's um, uh, thermodynamically uh, realistic, which is, or, or thermodynamically realizable, which is the average spin. So let me now define s i dot as the thermal average of sigma i dot. So what we have to do is compute the thermal average of minus two sigma i w i thermal average of all of this. So that's what we want to compute. And now, you know, these computations in general turn out to be kind of pleasant. And, it's, you know, the, the algebra of the Ising variables makes all this a very pleasant game. So let's see what comes out of this. So we have minus 2 sigma i, but w i is 1 half 1 minus sigma i tanch beta m. And then we want to take the average of all of this stuff. So there's the first term. There's 2, a half, sigma i with a minus sign. So the first term is the thermal average of sigma i. So that's minus si. And then the second term, so the 2 and the halves cancel. And then I have minus and minus becomes plus. Sigma i times sigma i. But here's something very useful uh, simplification, which is that Sigma i squared is 1, independent of whether sigma is plus 1 or minus 1, and square is 1. So then we're going to get plus. So all that goes away, tanch beta m. And now what's more useful to look at is the time rate of change of the magnetization. So the magnetization dot is equal to the summation over all sites i uh, divided by n of sigma i of s i dot. And so when we add up over all spins, so here we're just going to get minus m, and here we're just adding up n identical terms and dividing by n so nothing changes. And so we're going to get minus m plus tanch beta m. So this is the mean field equation for the evolution of the Ising model. m dot is equal to minus m plus tanch beta m. So in the end, we have a very simple equation, and now it's, a f it's fun to actually look at the consequences of this simple equation. So it turns out um, that the right way of approaching this is before you attempt to do any analytics on this is one should graph, uh, you know, it's, it's a first-order differential equation. It's what we call a dynamical system, a one-variable dynamical system, and it's very useful to plot as a function of m, m dot, and see what happens. So without this term here, then we just have uh, a line that looks like this. 
And so without this term here corresponds to beta equals zero, which is infinite temperature. So at infinite temperature, the dynamical behavior is given by this. And so if M is negative, then M dot is positive. And so this becomes a stable fixed point. And so in the case of uh, uh, beta uh, going to zero, or in fact, it turns out beta less than a critical temperature, which we'll come to in a moment, uh, this is a stable fixed point. So without doing any work, we already know that at, at high temperatures, sufficiently high temperatures, magnetization equals zero is a stable fixed point of the dynamics. On the other hand, for beta small enough, I'm sorry, yeah, for beta big enough, then you see that this hyperbolic tanch starts off with a positive slope. And so the positive slope near the origin is competing with the negative slope of, the, of this term here. And one finds that for um, a beta bigger than a beta C, that this function is going to have a positive slope near the origin. And so it's a function that looks something like this. And now, um, this is an unstable fixed point because if I'm just to the right of it, I flow, you know, m dot is positive, I flow away. If I'm just to the left, the m dot is negative, I flow away. And these become the stable fixed points. And there's two stable fixed points at m equilibrium. And, uh, well, okay, so just, I've, I can't remember the notation I have in my notes. So I'll just say minus plus m equilibrium and minus m equilibrium. They're symmetrically located. There are two solutions, and so we don't pick out which of the two solutions is selected. That actually depends on the initial condition. So, um, and, and then the last part is what happens right at um, beta C. And it turns out that right at beta C, this, uh, so I guess I'll put it up here now. So for beta equals beta C, and in this case, the critical temperature is equal to one. And right at beta C, then um, the slope of this guy, so you see that when beta is equal to 1, the slope of tanch near the origin is 1. That matches this, and so there is zero slope at the origin. So the function looks something like this. So this is beta equals beta C equals 1. And so this is, again, um, a stable fixed point, but you approach it not exponentially quickly be, because, there, because the slope is zero, and so there's a power law decay to the equilibrium state. So again, I'm plotting m dot as a function of m. So the th thing about doing a graphical analysis is that you can understand what's going to happen without doing any work, and so the other feature is that when you, if you know the answer before you start, then it's a lot easier to get the right answer by algebra, whereas if you don't know the answer, it's very easy to like get yourself balled up and not know what you're doing. So now that we know the answer, let's derive the answer. I mean, we might as well do it. Um, so let's see, what do I want to say here? Yeah, uh, just one more thing about this equilibrium state here, which is that, um, well, how do we find th these equilibrium values? So um, okay, so for, for uh, T less than TC, or the same as beta bigger than beta C, I have the equilibrium state defined by M dot is equal to zero. So zero is equal to uh, minus M plus tanch beta M. And I can write this zero is equal to minus M and now I can just do a power series expansion. So I'm going to get beta m minus one third beta m cubed plus dot, 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 dot. And so I have here um, one third beta m cubed, ignoring higher order terms, is equal to m beta minus one. And now that we know that the critical temperature is one, then close to beta equals one, we can forget about this gives me a higher order correction. So just set beta equals one over here. And so what we get is that M is, or M equilibrium is approximately equal to the square root of three uh, beta minus one. And so um, this defines a critical point exponent because normally um, at the phase transition, when one writes m scales as t minus tc to the power beta, and so we infer right away that beta is equal to one half. And this is the critical point exponent for the magnetization. 
Too many what? Oh. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, boy. <laughs> so for those of you un uninitiated in the audience, we typically use beta for the inverse temperature, but also beta is used as the critical point exponent. So for the purposes of not confusing, let me call this B. And B, but the point is that the magnetization <laughs> is measured, uh, is normally defined uh, with the exponent theta. Right, it's, right. But then what you showed me, you get... Uh, one over t, one over square root of t. I'm about, I'm about to do that. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay, that's no, fine. All right. So, um, as I say, we haven't, we, you know, I haven't done any, I haven't really done any de derivation yet. So let's now derive the approach to um, the equilibrium state. So for beta less than one, which is above the critical temperature, so the point is that, we're in this regime here where there's no other fixed points, and so in the long time limit, all we care about is what's happening very close to the origin. And so we can write m dot is equal to minus m uh, plus tan beta m, which I'm going to write as plus beta m. And so this is equal to m uh, beta minus 1. But I'll write this as minus m 1 minus beta. Since beta is less than 1, this is a positive coefficient. And so we're just going to have exponential approach to the final state. That is that m of t scales as e to the minus 1 minus beta t. So there's a sort of a critical relaxation time that scales like 1 over 1 minus beta. So if beta is small, the relaxation time is order 1. And as beta approaches 1, then this relaxation time grows and grows. And um, at the critical temperature, it's infinite. And something else happens there. Um, OK, and similarly, if beta, is, uh, um, if beta is less than 1, then the point is that you know, asymptotically in a long time limit, we just have to look locally near each of these fixed points. Clearly, there's a non-zero slope near each of these fixed points. And so locally near each of the fixed points, we're going to have an equation of the same type where instead of computing m dot, we're going to compute the deviation of m from its equilibrium value, and we'll have an m minus m equilibrium here, and we're going to get basically the same behavior. And I, I'll leave that as uh, exercise for someone who wants to just do it. But let's look for beta equals 1. So for beta equals 1, then I'm going to have um, m dot is a proxy equal to, so I have minus m plus beta m, the first term in expanding the hyperbolic tanch, uh, minus 1 third beta m cubed. But if beta is equal to 1, then this term cancels this, and I'm going to have m scales as minus 1 third m cubed. And the solution to this is that m of t asymptotically scales as 1 over the square root of time. So at the critical temperature, there's very slow relaxation to the equilibrium state of zero magnetization, whereas everywhere else there is exponential approach to um, the final state. So um, I'm going to stop here for just a minute to see if anyone's going to ask a question because I'm kind of at the end now of a, a, a little uh, of a story, the mean field solution for the Ising model. So any questions from anybody? No, you know what? Why I was talking because I would have expected that to be... Do you, maybe you should use this so other people can hear you. In full generality, I think this, sh this exponent should be t to minus, ah no, beta over nu z, no? I'm sorry, I'm not. So in general, if you, so this exponent, the uh, exponent of the relaxation of the magnetization should be, when you do scaling, t to minus beta over nu Z, I guess. Yes, no. yeah. So, uh, I mean, I haven't, I, I haven't introduced any dynamical exponent yet. But yeah, yeah, you, but you're, you're correct. I mean, there is um, it may choose, this it 1 over not. root t is related to a critical point, ex, you know, dynamical critical point exponent. And in this case, beta over nu z would be... Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's like 
one. I grew up in the time of, the, of all the fancy business with critical uh, exponents, and so if you asked me this question 40 years ago or 45 years ago, I knew the answer off the top of my head, but now okay, okay. I've forgotten. Okay, no, no, okay. No, but the, I think it may, no, no, it matches, it matches, yes, yes, okay, okay, thank you. Okay. All right, so um, fine. So now we've, we've solved the one-dimensional, I mean, the, the, the Ising model in the complete graph limit. And what I want to turn to now is the Ising model in one dimension because it can be exactly solved and it's very beautiful and it has lots of interesting connections with other uh, statistical mechanical models. So now let's look at the 1D Ising model. And so the Hamiltonian of this system would be equal to minus J summation over um, I, for example, and I can write this as sigma I, sigma I plus one. Because I'm only doing a sum over nearest neighbors. Yeah, ask away. So Do you want to use a microphone? Or? Yeah. Does it work? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So you started by defining the dynamics with the detailed balance, right? Yes. So if you define another type of dynamics would be, I mean, well, so in fact, this is this was like a frontier area some time ago because you know people were very frustrated that doing single spin flip dynamics, the dynamics was very slow, and if you wanted to like look at the critical point properties, you have to do mega simulations, you need supercomputers and all that, and so various people have invented other uh, algorithms where instead of flipping a single spin at a time, you flip many spins at a time. There's the Swenson Wang algorithm, there's the Wolf algorithm, there's all kinds of things there that people have implemented. And you, you want to check that detailed balance holds. And so that's usually the hard part of these more fancy algorithms to verify that detailed balance actually works. But yes, there are many, you know, there's many kinds of dynamics you can invent. I mean, single spin flip is simple, easy to appreciate, but it's extremely slow. And so that's the whole motivation for doing these other algorithms where multiple spins are flipped simultaneously. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right. So one dimensional Ising model. So we have this, and usually it's simplest to think of this as, uh, as the spins on a periodic ring so that, you know, we just go all the way around once and I don't have to, you know, yeah, that's fine. Um, so it turns out for reasons of simplicity, it's more convenient to write this as J over 2 summation over all I, uh, sigma I times sigma I minus 1 plus sigma I plus 1. Oh boy, let's try to make the penmanship better. Sigma i minus one plus sigma i plus one. And the reason for doing that is that it makes it a simpler story for writing down the hopping, the flip rate. So now let's look at w sub i, the flip rate of the i-th spin. And so this is equal to one half, one minus sigma i, and then I have hyperbolic tench, of beta, oh, I erased it. <sighs> nah, I erased it. So what was here? There was a summation uh, over all site neighbors j of sigma uh, i minus one plus sigma i plus one, and then I have a two, so beta over two. Um, I hope that's right. Just bear with me a second here. Yeah, okay, so I already made a mistake right at the very beginning here. So let's, um, let me just, yeah. Let me, let me just uh, start over again. Minus J, um, sigma I, summation. Sigma i minus 1 minus sigma i plus sigma i plus 1. So, uh, ah, try again. I'll, ge I'll get it right eventually. Minus, minus j, summation over all sides i, sigma i, sigma i minus 1 plus sigma i plus 1. So, uh, this is, I'll erase this. Start, so, scratch the last two minutes, start over again. So I'm going to write my Hamiltonian this way. It's just more convenient because, again, um, 
you know, the definition is I, saw, I take sigma i summed over its neighbors. So I'm explicitly writing the sum over neighbors as the left neighbor and the right neighbor. So this is my Hamiltonian. And so now the flip rate is equal to one half, one minus sigma i, and then I have hyperbolic tanch, beta, uh, summation over all neighbors. Uh, uh, so it's, it's just, I don't, there's no sum anymore because it's just the neighbors, it's the local field. So it's going to be sigma i minus one plus sigma i plus one. Uh, times J. Oh. Yeah. You are counting each pair twice, right? Um, yes, I am counting each pair twice. It's just, it's just convenient. Okay, so anyways, uh, and now comes, uh, I want to sort of take advantage of the algebra of the Ising model, so I'm going to now do the following thing, which does no violence, which is I'm going to divide here by two and multiply here by two. And now this variable, the sum of the sigmas, this variable is equal to plus or minus one or zero. That's all that can happen. And now I want to take advantage of the following fact that tanch, um, you know, tanch, uh, yeah, so tanch AX is equal to A tanch X for a equals plus or minus one or zero. Because the tanch function is an odd function. So if I change the sign of a inside, that changes the overall sign of the function. And if a is zero, then tanch of zero is zero. And so I can put it here with no violence to the system. So it turns out that we can now take this variable, which is inside the hyperbolic tanch. You know, again, let's maybe have my brackets look a little bit better. So here's curly brackets on the very outside. And then here we have hyperbolic tanch of all of this stuff here. And so I can take this variable and put it outside of the tanch without any violence, and all I have left back inside is hyperbolic tanch of 2 beta j. So let me now define the quantity gamma, which is hyperbolic tanch of 2 beta j. And so I can rewrite this flip rate as equal to 1 half 1 minus sigma i. Oh, let me put it this way. Uh, it's gamma sigma i sigma i minus one plus sigma i plus one. Uh, miss, uh, oh, so wait a second. There's one. There's one more mistake here, and that's because I erased my blackboard. Is there's there was a one half here originally, and so there's a one half here originally. Okay, so this is right. Yeah. No, no, the one half, because that's still inside the hyperbolic tanch. So tanch 2 beta j is what I'm calling gamma. Oh. Oh, yes. So, yeah. <laughs> this is why I needed my other blackboard. So was this, was this my rate? Let me just remind myself what it is. Yeah, this, this is the rate. And so, yes, the one half, when I bring this outside, there's the one half here. So, okay, everything is fine. Okay, very good. So the thing is that, by, uh, by this trick at zero temp, um, by this trick, um, we can sort of get rid of all these spin arguments inside the hyperbolic tanch. In principle, this is a complicated thing to deal with because if you expand the hyperbolic tanch in a power series, you've got all powers of sigmas, you've got a, there's a lot of combinatorics involved, but when you do it this way, you know, you just have like very simple products of sigmas to deal with algebraically. So let's now use this flip rate to compute um, like the e evolution of the magnetization. And, you know, so we'll fo follow the same program as we did in the complete graph limit, and we'll learn something interesting. Hopefully, we'll learn something interesting. So once again, we want to compute SI dot, which is the thermal average of sigma I dot. And so what we've seen from before is that, you know, when a spin flips, it, I it changes by minus twice itself with the rate W sub I, so this is nothing more than minus twice W i sigma i thermal average. So let's now compute this average and see what we get. So the one half and the two cancel, so there's a minus in front, and then I have sigma i times one minus 
gamma over 2 sigma i sigma i minus 1 plus sigma i plus 1. And so the first term just gives me minus sigma i. Our thermal average is sigma i, which is minus si. The second term is the minus and the minus cancel, so we have plus gamma over 2. Then I have sigma i, sigma i, which is 1. So we're going to have plus gamma over 2, sigma i minus, and now we take the thermal average and we're going to get um, si minus 1 plus si plus 1. So this is the equation of motion for um, the spin. And now if you look at it, you realize, if you stare at it with the right frame of mind, that this is almost the same as one of the first equations I wrote on the first day, which is it's just a one-dimensional diffusion equation. You see that involves hopping from I minus 1 to I, I plus, I mean from I minus 1 to I, I plus 1 to I. It's almost looking like a diffusion equ equation, except for the fact that there's this coefficient gamma sitting out in front. So aside from that, it really is a diffusion equation. And it turns out that this equation has a very simple solution, which I don't remember off the top of my head. But for the initial condition, si at t equals 0 equals delta of i0. That is that I start my initial state where spin at the origin is up, and all the other spins are equally likely to be up or down. And so we might expect that. Um, if I'm at least at high temperature, that this spin should disappear. It should, it should relax away. And so for this initial condition, the answer is the following. Si of t is equal to the following thing. It's equal to i, yeah, i sub i of gamma t, e to the minus uh, gamma t. So again, this is the modified Bessel function of the second kind of order i, and that's the answer. So we have the exact answer for the spin value uh, at a given site. And the thing is that what we're interested in typically is a long time limit, and, um, as, and so it turns out that um, in the long time limit, this thing goes like e to the minus 1 minus gamma t, so for time going to infinity. So this is going to zero. So in fact, we learn more or less nothing. All we know is that the spin value disappears. And if gamma is not equal to 1, it decays exponentially quickly. And if gamma is equal to 1, and if you go back to where I had to erase it, but uh, when beta goes to, uh, when the temperature goes to 0, which is beta going to infinity, we have hyperbolic tangent of infinity, which is 1. So when the temperature is 0, then magically um, this becomes 1. And so, in fact, this has a falling answer, 1 over the square root of t um, uh, in the limit for uh, gamma equals to 1, which is the same as the temperature equals 0. So at zero temperature, the relaxation is slow. It's power law. At finite temperature, the relaxation is quick. It's um, exponential. But we don't learn very much, because all we see is that like the spin goes away. So, uh, and in fact, Exactly. That's right. So, I mean, the comment you just made is there's no spontaneous magnetization in the one-dimensional Ising model at any non-zero temperature. So it's what we expect. There should be no order at any finite temperature. But the point is that we're missing an opportunity because there's a lot of interesting behavior still hidden in not the average value of the spin, but the spin correlation functions. So, in fact, the spin correlation functions are the elemental objects which was, with which we should focus on to understand the dynamics of the one-dimensional easing model. So I'm, I think I'm just out of time. Uh, so I guess maybe that's a reasonable point to stop. But let me just sort of tantalize you with the next part of this, which is that after doing all this work and computing the average value of the spin, we learn nothing. So how can we learn something? And the way we learn something is by looking at the spin correlation functions. And there we will see that there's interesting dynamical behavior. And uh, it's very beautiful and it's very helpful. Uh, and it gives us a lot of insight. So that's what I'll do starting in like four hours from now.